Hello everyone and welcome back to another podcast here on our channel NarcCon where we deal with all things in relation to the narcissistic personality disorder and today I'm going to answer a request or a number of requests for a podcast on the narcissist as a friend, your narcissistic friendship, which for a lot of people is even more devastating to find out that their friend is a narcissist than it is in an intimate relationship setting, if that can be imaginable. And I guess it's the, the fact that we choose our friends and we rely on our friends to be there, even in situations where relationships break down. And their loyalty and their support really backs us up as people. So to discover someone is not your friend, is the opposite of your friend, is quite devastating and hard to get over. So today we're going to look at what defines a person who is your friend as possibly being a narcissist. What are the signs you can look out for and effectively what's the best way of extricating yourself from that relationship when it's definitely not serving you any longer and it's actually probably having a destructive or detrimental effect on you. So let's get into it. First of all, I'd like to define, you know, what your idea of a friend is or what our general idea of a friend is and go from there. The expectations people have are often are re very relevant to the definition of their friend letting them down or their friend not being loyal. And it's important to define the expectation of what we're expecting from a person that we call our friend before we get into the signs to look for in relation to identifying that they're a possible narcissist. So I'll give you a general or my definition of what a good friend would be and let me know if you agree with this. Different people have different ideas of what a friend should do for them and what a friend should be to them. But my idea of a friendship would be, a good friendship would be a reciprocal relationship where you both look out for each other, where there is loyalty and genuine love, where you're there for the person in good times and bad, you're a constant in their life, you have their back, you're supportive of them, you're happy when they do well, and you share in, again, in, in their down times and comfort and support them and encourage each other and be excited for each other and you know, have a lot of strong and positive emotions around each other. So that would be, I suppose, a class one friend in certainly in my opinion. The people that we meet along life's journey that we will term as friends, very few of them will meet all those expectations. So for want of just sharing a bit of experience, what I've learned to do when I feel that I've a friend and they, I feel let down by them, I'll have a look at the, my expectations of the friendship and their expectations of the friendship. And I found it useful to come down a notch if the person genuinely, if, if I enjoy the time with the person or enjoy, say, doing sports with the person, but they don't seem to want to take it further than that, then I will kind of have a second category of friends. And that is friends, you know, that I'd enjoy doing things with. So friends that you might go hiking with, but they don't have the time or the inclination to maybe see you outside that activity. So I would more or less have a second category of friends that I would term acquaintance friends or friends for this, friends that like doing this with me and we have great fun for those activities, but they don't seem to want to go further or take it a level further. And when you come to terms with this and there's no badness, you know, you actually enjoy the person's company, I would call that a second level friend. Third level would be an acquaintance. So you may know people in common and you would stop along the way to say hi, you'd pass the time of day with them and you might see them at different functions and inquire as to how they are and their family, but generally wouldn't take it further than that. 
So it's, a, I think, a healthy thing to understand your expectations, the other person's expectations, and have an acceptance around that. Once you have that type of, you know, levelness about you and a levelness as to what a friend is and where this person fits into your life, then I believe we can look at the signs that you're with a narcissist. And we'll take it from the, I suppose, the, the first level friend. We'll take it from where you both have high expectations of each other, where you've both more or less, you've known each other maybe a long time. You've made it known that you support each other and they say they support you. So we're going to take it from the true friend perspective and what signs to look out for that they don't match up to the true friend when you both have placed each other in that particular category. Before we look at the signs, I just want to tip on the fact that we can have fair weather friends, which would be friends in good times that share your good times with you, but aren't there for the bad times or aren't, aren't there in general. And then there's the friends that are there when you're really at rock bottom, but they're never there to share the good times with you. Those type of friends could indeed be narcissists. One may be the narcissist that uses you when you're up and uses you for fun when you're having a good time. The other person could be a narcissist loving seeing you down, loving seeing you seeing you sad, etc, etc. Or they may be just transitory friends who have a better, who are better for you in either time. Possibly narcissists because they aren't constant, but not everybody who fits that category is a narcissist. So let's look at the, the rest of the main signs that your friend who you hold dear, who's been with you through thick and thin, may be a narcissist. And the first sign I would say to look out for is look at their other relationships. Look how they treat other people. You know at this stage from your education on what a narcissist is, how they treat others, what type of relationships they have with others and the signs of narcissism within those relationships. So if you're trying to make an overall assessment of the person that you hold dear, that you are loyal to the nth degree to, that is your bestie, that's your homie, that's your very best friend in the whole world. Look at their other relationships and then let's go through the rest of the criteria and see if they tick the boxes in these particular sections in order to help you ascertain whether you wish to continue this relationship or whether you wish to back away from it more. Was there, for instance, with this particular friendship, maybe it's relatively new, maybe you've only known the person in the last six months or a year, was there an intense start to the relationship, similar in effect to the narcissist's love bomb in the intimate relationship? You'll know if something's a bit kind of strange, if the person is all over you immediately, wants to spend a lot of time with you, says you're the best thing since fried bread, um, wants to, ad admires you a lot, praises you a lot, kind of looks up to you like as if you're some kind of star figure. You kind of go, that's a little bit too much. That's a little bit too much, too quick, too soon for me to really trust the person. Even though it feels really good, you're absolutely you know, you feel good is a real feel good factor. They seem to share in a lot of your interests and you have a lot to talk about. Just be aware that it's not a mirroring process and that it's not a narcissist trying to buy their way into your trust. There's no harm in taking friendships slowly, just like you do when you meet somebody that you're going to possibly be in an intimate relationship with. There's no harm. And if that person has respect for you, will that person will have no problem with that either. The third sign I would say that the narcissist may be, your narcissist, or sorry, your friend may be a narcissist would be 
and this is a horrible one and this is quite frustrating to experience and I personally experienced this with a long-term friend until I finally um finally drew the line drew a line in the sand and that's withholding normally if you have a need for something in the relationship or you are looking for a piece of information you're looking to borrow a certain item of clothing something is really important to you and you let your friend know that and you're looking for that information from them and they withhold that they make excuses as to you know they put it into the future and say yeah i'll get back to you tomorrow on that or yeah you can have a loan of that but it's in the cleaners the dry cleaners at the moment um they're withholding they're not saying yeah of course come on let's do that wait till i find that out for you give me a minute and i'll find that out for you they're they're making you feel uncomfortable like you're under a compliment to them and they either make you wait quite a long time and then breadcrumb it out to you, give you little bits of the information and keep you on the string dangling, saying that they'll get the rest of the information for you at a later date and you have to keep following them up and you're, it's like you're under a compliment to them. That's not a friend. That's not someone who wants to help you or has your best interests at heart. And I mean when they do this on a constant basis on a constant basis, if they know that something is extremely important to you, they they won't do it as much if you kind of ask them casually for something. They may, you know, give that and give a lot more. But when they know you really need that information, they will torture you with withholding and then breadcrumbing it out to you in little pieces or not giving it to you at all. And saying they've decided that it's not good for you or something in that nature where they make the decision for you, even though you want, you asked for something that you needed. The next thing one of these narcissist friends will do is give you bad advice under the guise of it being good for you or under the guise that they really believe that they're giving you good advice. And one of those areas that they can do that, and this is a, it may seem very, what can I say, very unimportant, but the motivation behind this, even though it's not a very serious thing, the motivation behind it shows you the intent and their intent and feeling towards you. So that's what's important here. So they may give you bad advice on clothing, on what colours suit you, um, how you're styling yourself. And you come to understand the more you take their advice, you come across someone who is actually a friend and they finally say to you, look, I don't know why you're doing that. You know, why you do that to yourself? Why you wear those, say, dull colours or why you wear that gaudy yellow colour because it really doesn't suit you and I, I just I, I'd like to tell you that because you're so gorgeous and you can do so much better for yourself so eventually the penny drops in relation to the bad clothing advice or uh, as an instance that actually happened to me that I'll share with you is I remember going into a store I, th I think I may have shared this before and I remember trying on this it was a thrift store I remember trying on this Ralph Lauren dress and I'd always wanted a Ralph Lauren dress and I couldn't believe it was in my size and I tried it on and this particular friend who I'd known for years but always had these strange feelings around you know the withholding and the rest that I'll come to now and when I tried it on I remember the person in the shop said well that looks really nice on you that you should buy that that looks really nice on you and the friend came up behind me and she tugged the back of the dress and she literally tugged me backwards and said, don't be ridiculous. That's way too big for you. You need it to be much tighter than that. And anyway, your friend, you know, your one of your best friends tells you this. And I was, oh, gosh, really? And, you know, she said, you know, think about it or whatever, but you shouldn't get it. It, it really doesn't do anything for you. And I remember being silly enough and not self-directed or confident enough 
to actually walk out of the store without purchasing something that really did probably look very good on and something that I had would have wanted, you know, and genuinely, if I'd been on my own, would have gotten. The next day, she suggests going back to the store. She goes in and goes to see if the dress is still there, goes up to the dress, picks it off the, the rail and says, oh, that'll do me very, that'll do me very well for a business meeting. I'm a little bit bigger than you, so that'll be fine on me. Well, <laughs> the penny did drop, you know, the penny did drop eventually. It took a bit of time for the cogs to turn in my brain. But I think that, I think in that moment, I finally decided that I had to see the truth, even though it was a trivial a trivial example or a trivial thing with all the other accumulation of the things that had happened over the years, I finally had to say, Paula, this person does not have your best interests at heart. Reflect back on all the different things that have happened over the years and make a decision as to how you want to proceed going forward. Do you want to continue to be frustrated do you want to continue to be at this person's beck and call? Do you want to continue um, having information withheld or support withheld or other bad advice, which I'll get into now? Bad advice. They may give you bad advice on your relationships when you come to them and, you know, your loyal friend, you want to discuss different relationships you have, or if you have a relationship problem, what they'll actually do is be as divisive as possible if they're a narcissist and will bring out the negative and focus on the negative where a more measured compromising suggestion may have been much more beneficial to you maintaining a relationship that's actually important in your life. So you'll find that listening and taking their advice and being poked and pushed towards the negativity in your other relationships, where they really want to isolate you so you're dependent on them, just like all narcissists do, and just like narcissists do in the intimate relationship setting. You will find being around them, there's a, a negative focus on other people in your life. And because you believe in them and you believe they love you and you believe they're your friend, they're your friend, your bestie, that they have your best interests at heart. And indeed, a lot of your other relationships suffer because you're listening to them. You're listening to that negativity and it benefits them to be more reliant on, for you to be more reliant on them. The next sign that your friend may be a narcissist is they'll triangulate you with their possessions or their prosperity or their success in life or their new car or their talent. They'll basically want you to admire them and be envious or try and get you to be to feel less than because a narcissist is envious of other people. They feel that everybody else is envious of them. So they will do their best to push any success they have in their life in your face so that they'll see from you that you admire what they've done or, you know, you praise what they have or what they've achieved. And they'll feel superior to you, particularly if they know that you don't have that or that you would have liked that or that you're going through a bad time now and that you don't have that. So with a friend who would be compassionate and caring, they're going to damp down, you know, something amazing that happens to them, or they're want, going to want to share it with you to bring you up. They're not going to push it in your face and say, look what I have. I'm brilliant. This is brilliant. And well, it's a shame that you are where you are, but this is me and I'm superior to you. So guys, let me know in the comments if something like that has happened to you. 
um, and examples of it would be great for other people to identify with and resonate with. The next thing I'd say to you is um, everything has to be on their terms. And you're kind of going sometimes, you know, it's when you're in the haze, when you're in the fog of being with a narcissist. And a lot of the time they will actually. They will actually go, you go through phases of love bombing with a narcissistic friend where they will be or appear to be your best friend and you will have enjoyable times with them and they will give from time to time like they will enhance your life they may bring you to a concert that you wouldn't otherwise have gone to or they'll they'll do something that's beneficial to you from time to time in order to keep you hooked and confused and in the fog thinking well they really must be my good friend because Remember the time they did this or that. So they do do the love bomb, particularly in a long term friendship from time to time to keep you mesmerized and to keep you on side, so to speak. So it's it's not always easy to identify the times when their true selves are coming to the fore. But if you look back on the relationship overall, and the long term things that have happened long term in the relationship, the majority of the stuff that happens will be in the narcissist's favor and to your detriment. And a lot of things because of the relationship with them, a lot of negative things and negative feelings will be coming up in you over the years or the months or the days that you've been with them. So there are terms, everything is done on their terms. They may do it in a nice way. They may make suggestions after you make a suggestion that you do it this way. They may say, well, this would be a better way to do it. And you being a compromising, loving, um, not wanting argument, or just generally wanting them to be happy will go along with their terms in general. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you a good example, when I was coming up to the end of my long term friendship with this person, when the pennies were dropping, they were clanging down on my head like big bombs. And I had to wake up to the fact that this person did not have my best interests at heart. It was very painful. It's very hurtful because you've given your love, your time, your loyalty and your support to a person and You've built a bond, you think, with them, as with all relationships with narcissists. When you wake up and smell the coffee and have to either be left or leave the relationship, it is very painful. So this was a particular, this was her wedding. She was getting married later in life and the wedding was in a different country. We didn't live in the same country, which probably made the relationship last longer than it may otherwise have lasted as the meetings were intermittent and the communication was intermittent. Sorry, my friend is getting quite active there in the back. <laughs> um, yeah, so the wedding was coming up and I was given an invitation and there was a stipulation on the invitation. I still can't believe this really. The stipulation said that I could bring a family member, but not a partner. <laughs> and I know you'll think, for goodness sake, Paula, when you, when you got that invitation, surely you must have, you know, <laughs> you must have realised there was something very, very wrong here. But again, to my credit, I'm trying to give myself some credit. I would have been quite accepting of different things. This came along quite near the instant of the dress and me being pulled back at the shop and told it didn't suit. So I remember at that stage thinking, I think that she, she, the person I was going out with at the time, she didn't particularly like, but she'd never met them. She didn't approve of the circumstances or something. I think that was what she said. 
so that she didn't want me bringing a partner. She only wanted me to bring a family member and that could be my son or could be my father. And I realised at that stage that really to be dictated to like that was not something a friend would do. And I believe she didn't want to be in any way upstaged at her wedding by the happiness, by maybe my happiness at attending the wedding with a partner. That's the only conclusion I could come to. And it fitted in well with things that had happened in the past. So that's just an example. I hope maybe even though it's a very odd one, it might resonate in relation to the narcissistic friend does not like to be outshone at any stage. So they'll keep you around longer if you're not competition for them. They don't like competition or they like to be one up on you or better than you or feel they look better or they're happier than you. They're richer than you. They're, you know, better looking than you, whatever. They have a better job than you. That often suits the narcissistic friend, excuse me, because it enables them to feel superior to you. The next sign that you may be with a narcissist is you've shared confidential details with them. You've shared something very close to your heart with them and they retell your story and they retell it in a way. And this is an interesting one. They retell it in a way that is not uh, reflecting you in a good light. Whatever story you have told them that you didn't want passed on. And this is something narcissists do and family members can often do this as well with the competition of a narcissist, particularly in the friendships. They're very, very, very competitive. If they, like all narcissists, want to be the one in the limelight, the where the attention is, and they feel people like you more or people have a good opinion of you and maybe you have a shared circle of friends or a shared social circle and people are coming up to them believing that they're your friend and they're complimenting you to the narcissist. This is a no-no for the narcissist and the narcissist has to change this very quickly to bring the attention back on to them. So what they do is they build up a picture like a PR agency. They build up a picture in that circle of you, of a different person to who you are. They basically slander your character or create an image of you that is not who you are in a negative context. Then what they do is they will go to you and say something to you or say something to you when you're in the group of people that they know will get a certain reaction from you. And supposing it's a quick annoyed reaction because they're sharing something maybe they shouldn't share. The people in the group, the narcissist will have told prior to this, that you're very quick tempered and that you can be quite nasty and that you don't treat them very well maybe. Whereas you may be a very affable, nice person. So in that instance, the narcissist baits you into having a reaction that matches the PR propaganda they've put out when slandering your character. This makes the narcissist feel superior to you and enables them to feel in control of the situation, in control of you and in control of the perception of you and the perception of them in the illusory, illusion-like reality that they create. They are literally like spell makers. They have gotten the people in the area that you're, the social circle that you're in, to believe you're someone that you're not. And they build into this over the years. And you're often wondering why people react in a certain way to you when it doesn't quite make sense. Well, that's a friend who's a narcissist, who does not have your best interests at heart, who's built up a PR campaign against you in the background. Very subtle, but you know you're feeling in your gut 
something is not right. But it's very hard to put your finger on it, to raise it up and say, this is what it is. Maybe now in your situation, if that resonates with you, look at the friend who calls themselves a friend in the context of whether they may indeed be a narcissist. And that's what I would call the social control setting. We've got two more signs that your friend is a narcissist and then how to end the friendship if you feel that you've come to the conclusion that the person is not your friend. They may also cheat on you in that they may take your partner. They may be cheating with your partner behind your back. And people say, well, this is an unusual situation. It's actually more common than you might imagine. A narcissist is your best friend and is often around, you know, your house or whatever and partakes in, say, threesomes in your marriage. And I'm not talking about the bedroom threesomes. I'm talking about, say, social occasions or, you know, going on holidays together or whatever. Be careful of that one if that person has signs, shows signs of being a narcissist because there's no boundaries for narcissists. Nothing would give a narcissist more satisfaction in their envy or jealousy of you than to take your partner away from you and to have that partner for themselves. With all the other people in the whole wide world, the person that would give a double whammy of pleasure to a narcissist is to take your partner away from you. And the last thing I have down that's a sign your friend is a narcissist, and this often happy, happens in youth, but it can happen further down the line, they copy you. They copy your style. They copy your ideas. They pass those off as their own. Um, maybe you've gotten a piece of jewellery. They get a piece of jewellery the exact same, get it, you know, and show it off to people. And people say, oh, my goodness, I think your friend has, has the same piece of jewellery. And the narcissist will say, well, she liked mine and she went and bought she, she went and bought the same. So they'll turn the story around. But it's frustrating because some narcissists, you may have remembered this from high school or whatever. Some narcissists will copy, copy, copy everything you do. And it's very difficult for younger people to be able to deal with that when a person, the narcissist, who poses as their friend, continually copies them and nearly tries to become them. That's a real big red flag that the person is a narcissist. So if you come to the conclusion and you decide, oh my goodness, I have to, I have to wake up to the fact that this person is, isn't my friend and does not have my best interests at heart, and in fact, is doing me damage and could do me huge potential damage, particularly with what they know about me um, and the mutual connections that you have. My best advice would be to back away slowly. And the reason I say that is the back away slowly, spend less time with them, grey rock them more, um, don't share any further information with them. And if you have a social circle that's shared, whatever excuse you give to the narcissist, like I, I'm, I'm studying more or I don't have as much time anymore or I'm not feeling up to it, make sure that that message goes out to other people in the circle as well. Because what will ensue, if you don't do this slowly, if you back away quickly, the narcissist will cause a drama around it and will start a smear campaign about how badly you've treated them and what an awful person you are. So at least if you've laid the groundwork, and this is actually, in a way, taking a leaf out of the narcissist's playbook, where they set the smear campaign up on you way before you actually realise there's a smear campaign going on. What you're doing effectively is to protect yourself against the definite smear campaign that will come your way. And what you say to the narcissist is you're less available because 
you put that out in if you have a shared social circle. You're very, very busy at the moment and you have a lot on your mind and on your plate and you can't be as available, you know, as you normally are. So when the narcissist goes to your shared acquaintances and says, oh, you know, Paula's really let me down. Um, she's been very nasty to me and she won't help me with this. They'll say, oh, well, she did say that she, she, she had a lot on her plate and she seemed very stressed and very worried. So I guess that's what it is. Well, you know the narcissist is going to blow a gasket when they hear that. How and ever, let them blow a gasket. Let them blow as many gaskets as they want. At least you're doing the best to protect yourself, to withdraw from this negative person who is in fact your worst enemy. Because they know information on you. They're maybe part of your family or social circle. And they're in a position to do you, to cause you a lot of problems, cause you a lot of stress, cause you a lot of drama and to, you know, have enough fallout for you to take quite some time to recover. So protect yourself first, withdraw slowly and eventually, eventually close that relationship down because unless you want to keep them, as they say, keep your enemies close, uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, withdraw and maybe have them in the periphery of your life where you know what they're doing. But that's a decision for you to make and it depends on the viciousness or the vitriol that comes from that person in general. So that's quite a long discussion, guys, on the narcissist as a friend and I hope it's been helpful if the podcast has been of value, please consider hitting those buttons for me. It does a lot of a lot of good for the channel and getting the word out there and keeping me at this and um, keeping me in our community. And which is something I really enjoy doing, getting that information out there and just providing a safe place for us all to be in recovery from this awful um, personality disorder and individuals we meet with it. So from himself and myself, myself on a cold January day, we will bid you adieu until the next time and you take care, great care of yourselves. Please look after yourselves and remember self-care. Remember, remember to love yourself the way you would love somebody else because at the very least, we deserve that. Bye for now.